Don't be surprised. 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 Don't be with this festival? We first did it, I'm trying to think when we did it at the Coliseum. It was, the, yeah. it was a few years ago, and that was really quite an 2000, extraordinary. 2010. 2008. Eight. 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 And that was, I think, probably still one of my favorite gigs, just to be able to play in, in, in that place. Um, it was an incredibly memorable occasion. Uh, it was a different kind of feeling festival from what it is at the, at the, at the raceway, but it was still a very special uh, occasion for us, and I think one of the things, one of the reasons why it was so good for us, was we've played a lot in California. LA has always been a really important place for us to come and play, and I think by the time we did EDC, even though maybe we were playing a little bit above our pay grade, um, we managed to, to to do a really good set on the main stage because we had outside of EDC pulled in a lot of fans working with Pasquale in uh, in California in the years before. So we kind of hit the ground running with EDC really. It was uh, special with that, that show, um, and specifically, nobody wanted the closing set. And so we took a huge risk, like, let's do this, let's close it out. It was from two to four at the time, and it turned out to be the most epic set of the whole night. So I think it, it propelled them in such a way that... Yeah. Is there something about EDC that's distinct from the other festivals that, that you go to? Um, you know, you guys travel the world and see a lot. Well, I think when we started coming to EDC, the, the sort of, um, I suppose, the West Coast thing, people are very sort of open about liking things. And especially if I compare it to the UK, it feels that there's this sort of open celebration of, of togetherness that is uh, unlike uh, any festival at EDC. So um, for me, that's what really makes, makes EDC what it mm. is. We should explain that there is a distinction between uh, a band set up and a DJ set up for you guys. Last year, Tony, you were not here at EDC. Jono right. was here. Pavo, you were here. Yeah. Um, magical moment for Above and Beyond. But um, wh why do you, um, you know, set things up that way um, instead of just everyone going to every show? Um, and did you feel bad about missing uh, 2013 EDC? No, because I, I, you know, I'd done a, f a few before that were equally good. It's two in the team, three in the squad. We rotate like any good team, really. Um, you really only need two people to do a DJ show anymore. It gets a little bit, there's too much time to, to not do anything. Uh, and we are a 360 degree kind of animal. We need to do other things while the gigs are happening. We need to be producing music in the studio at home. We need to be making our own radio show. And so by sending two and leaving one at home, those things keep moving and we can do more shows because we can play every weekend and we can all still get some time off. And uh, it just makes it more interesting for us too. Uh, tell us more about the 360 degree animal, <laughs> um, the evolution of it. Give us some perspective, um, just starting with the, the genesis of, of the group. Well, actually, we started when Jono and me were both still at university studying music business. And um, our sort of instinct was that, okay, if we write music together, let's press up some vinyl. Uh, let's risk our student loans on pressing up, uh, I think we did 2,000 vinyl. And, um, and it sort of naturally started from, from that kind of thing. We were doing everything, obviously, ourselves. Um, what year was this? This is in 2000 and 2001. And, um, and then, I think quite quickly through Tony's connections, we ended up making uh, more remixes for bigger artists than, than us, and, and through that got a real sort of opportunity to, to reach people way beyond uh, you know, our sphere of, of uh, a fan base. So. Do you think having your, your studies be music business, did that you know, help you appreciate that the artist needs to be more than just you know, writer, producer, you have to promote and market and, you know, be director of social marketing and everything. Yeah, like I, I, I've always been personally very in, interested in, you know, what makes, uh, you, know, you know, one amazing song do better, more successfully than another amazing song. And, um, 
And I went to a music high school in Finland where I, I met so many amazing musicians and great songwriters and and you know some of them you know had an amazing career and and some of them didn't and it left me with that kind of open question you know what is it and and that's what i went to study in london and James, we've wanna... been exploring with the, with our team for the last 15 years i, I want to ask you about your respective roles how things shake out um and then i do want to get to james on on your uh, position as a manager helping to to shape all of this energy but um, within the group w what are each of your strengths that you kind of have this mutual respect for Jono and Pavo are really good uh, musicians uh, I'm a kind of self-taught musician my thing is more um, lyrics and melody songs and Jono and Pavo are also fantastic engineers too and producers so we kind of mix and match our talents. Um, I think we all take a view on, on the direction that Above and Beyond is taking, but as you discovered in the room there, it's not always the same. It's not, I think, always this kind of planned out future for Above and Beyond. It's evolving all the time. We make decisions based on how we're feeling at that moment in time and you know, you know, how the, we feel the music is moving and so sometimes we take risky decisions that don't seem to be part of some future direction like the acoustic thing. Um, I think that just felt like a really good thing to do even though there was no precedent in our scene to do it. It just felt like something that Above and Beyond should do. So we're still, it's a very fluid thing. There's lots of opinions all the time. So uh, our roles are, I think, to, to, to fight our corner most of the time. <laughs> And James, how do you go about shaping this wonderful uh, chaos? <laughs> um, it's, it's very much a collaborative effort. Um, I mean, back when, we, when I first started, it was around the time of the first Above and Beyond single. So it was a track called Far From In Love. And I think we instinctively thought, well, we better try and sign this to a major record label, even though we had Anjuna Beats on the go at that point. And so I went around all the major labels. It was just around the time they'd had their fingers burnt, I think, with dance music. And, you know, perhaps the bottom was beginning to fall out of that, that market for them, and we, we couldn't actually sign above and beyond for love nor money. So at that moment in time, we just thought, well, fuck it, we'll do it ourselves. And I suppose inadvertently then, we, we kind of created and pursued the model that everyone now is looking at, which is, you know, we do everything ourselves out of house. And by releasing above and beyond's music on Anjuna Beats, it's attracted other artists, you know, of a very high caliber. And I guess one of the things we're probably most proud of is the fact that we've, we've not been reliant on that major label machine to get us to where we are now. We've been very much sort of in, in control of our own destiny from the beginning. So has having the label you know, as, as part of the uh, bigger picture for you helped um, give a structure going forward in a kind of a, I guess, a, a, a backbone to everything that you, you want to explore? I think so, yeah, because I think it works on a number of levels. It, we do the weekly radio show, which is heavily um, influenced by what's new on the label. Um, so that, that really helps. And then also just on like a kind of staffing level, we have a big team of people, 15 people in an office, who sometimes they're focused on label business, but when we have a big project like Above and Beyond at Madison Square Garden, we can apply all of that resource to that project. So it definitely works for us across the board. It's, it's my sense that you've, you've been purists over the years, um, and I do want to talk about the acoustic uh, project because that's very interesting, um, and also just the results of that, you know, how you feel about it looking back. But is it fair to say that you've, you've really been purist through and through, even when the sound, you know, isn't necessarily in vogue? Well, I remember when we were writing our first single, um, we actually ended up calling it Ocean Lab. We, we had another artist name for it because we were a little bit worried that maybe what we're making is a little bit too commercial. Um, and now looking back on it, it's, it's actually kind of funny. That why, why did we not have the courage to just be openly what, what it is that we like doing? Because actually, um, you know, the Ocean Lab singles we made, we all really loved and, and um, since now we've we've stopped doing most of our other artist names and, and everything is coming out as as above and beyond and i think for us being purists has always just been you know trying not to be too influenced by what's going around us uh, because we've got enough 
you know, differences of opinion between ourselves, and then that's exciting enough. And, and I think that's where that sort of purist kind of thing, if, if you want to call it that, would come from. But I also think being free from, from the, the major label idea of what pop music should be at the beginning enabled us to be kind of ruthless in our own vision. Um, and that became real in, in, in other areas other than the music. We have a healthy obsession with Helvetica typefaces. We're, you know, really anal about the way the artwork looks. Um, we spent a lot of time and energy thinking about what color each sleeve of all the releases should be. Um, the kind of artwork that we do for our albums, the kind of stuff that we do for our show. We really try and make everything we do as good as it can be, as far as we're concerned, you know, the highest quality that it can be. We use the best mix engineer, we use the best sleeve designer in the world, I think. So we're, we're, we're trying to, to excel in every way that we can, not just in the, in the music, but um, as, as Paolo said, you know, we, we have always been um, fairly broad in our music approach, but I think the, uni the unifying thing is, is the, the nature of our music is incredibly emotional. That's really been the, the hallmark of Above and Beyond and Ocean Lab, and in part the, the, the artists that we signed to the labels to make sure that the, the emotion is there in the music, because that's always been the thing that's, that's driven us and attracted us to music. What's the most commercially successful track that you've released? And then what's the most personally meaningful uh, track that you've put out? What's the most commercially successful track? Uh, I mean, commercially played? successful probably Sun and Moon, which is on over sort of 10 million views on YouTube and it's probably sold close to 100,000 copies worldwide, I guess. Um, you better answer, answer the other I mean, I, th I think it's pretty meaningful. Like most of our songs, it's based on a, on a real life experience, you know? So. So that Same song one. is also... <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, take us into the studio on that song. Uh, do you remember writing it, coming up with the, the lyric and the, the melody and all Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I mean, we actually wrote it for the Ocean Lab album, um, but for various reasons, Justine didn't, wasn't really feeling the lyric, so it was sitting around for about four years and going through various changes before it became an Above and Beyond signal, single. The original... Uh, version of it actually is based on a really beautiful arpeggio which I think Parvo wrote which is still to this day I don't know if you've ever released it one of the most beautiful bits of music I think we've ever done but it, it wouldn't really work in a club so the club version that we came up with I think was incredibly exciting the, the mix that we ended up putting behind the song that had been around for four years gave it this new lease of life and gave it the, the appeal that it's got that is fascinating to me that a song would sit unfinished for four years. Mm. I mean, how does that happen? It's just in, in a hard drive somewhere and you're... No, we're sitting in iTunes <laughs> with demos. <laughs> you just come back it. to it every yeah. once in a while and think, yeah. oh, we've got to finish this one. But well, qu yeah. quite often the way we work is that we might write a song without having a full electronic production to go with it at that point. Um, and Sun and Moon was one of those tracks where we knew it had something really good about it, but we didn't know how to produce it and we tried. And and failed and tried again and failed but there was something about the track that we all really liked that kept us trying for four years until we get, got there and I think um, you know some tracks we can do sometimes in a couple of days and sometimes it can take four or five years um, and strangely enough it's you know uh, there's no pattern to it you know what is the right way of working but uh, but I'm glad that we never gave up with Sun and Moon. Yeah, so <laughs> You know, let's talk about putting um, a song to the ultimate test, which is uh, changing the arrangement um, and your experiments. Is it fair to say experiments in, in the uh, acoustic space? Uh, you staged a few shows, just Los Angeles and London, right? Yeah. Um, talk about how those came together and how were they received? I used to watch uh, MTV Unplugged back in the 90s and I saw, you know, Nirvana do it and Alanis Morissette do it and I always thought, you know, if I was in a successful band, I'd want to do MTV Unplugged. That and Top of the Pops were the things that, you know, you looked up to when you were a kid. Um, and since it's not really in existence at MTV in the same way, we, we eventually decided that we would do it ourselves. But changing the nature of the way that our songs sound is something that we do all the time. I mean, the nature of electronic music is that remixes happen. Some other artists 
puts their spin on the way that the, the song should sound, often changing the chords and the structure and changing the nature of the way that the, the vocals put forward. So we're all quite used to hearing that in dance music. I mean, we, we started as remixes. So to do it in a, in a way that was just purely acoustic, we'd done it on a few of our tracks before. We'd done it on um, Satellite. There was a, a, a winner of a remix competition was kind of acoustic. Um, which did very well. And then we also did an acoustic mix of On A Good Day. So we had these nascent kind of acoustic things in existence. And then we thought it would be really great. To, I mean, I just really fancy playing live. We tried doing an electronic show in Beirut, which was kind of tough to, to, to do it at, at the volume of, of electronic music. It's very hard to, to perform at that volume, especially for singers. So to do it something, you know, to do something a little quieter felt like it might be a fun thing to do. And by the time that we did it, we'd been together for 12 years and we'd built up this catalog of music that was very well known. So you could take a punt and change it and people would be surprised when it turned out to be Miracle or Sun and Moon or whatever else it might be. So it was just, you know, it was the, the timing was right. And, and I think for us, it was just a very, it was just a great fun thing to do. And, and how, how did you work out the arrangement? Did you kind of assign different parts of the track to different instruments that would be on stage? Well, Bob uh, Bradley's been incredibly um, central to that whole remixing of the tracks in the uh, acoustic form. Um, you know, Bob worked with us on, on you know, doing really rough versions of them and, and, and then doing the instrumentation, uh, hooked us up with an incredible um, String arranger as well, and 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 I, I see me, Bob as the sort of musical director of the whole project, and mm. and we've always just been bouncing ideas of him. Uh, so it's a shame he's not here to, <laughs> to talk. Yeah, to us it was today. a nice occasion just to be the band and be produced rather than have to do everything. You know, the the other nice thing was there was no original plan to do Los Angeles. It was just to do the London shows, get them filmed, get it up on YouTube, and move on. But I think. We had the Greek theatre held for a club show, and as the London week unfolded, it was just obvious there was something really special going on. And I can still remember being outside, Tony was smoking a fag, and I just said to him, mate, I think we should do acoustic at the Greek. There's no point doing a club show at the Greek. The world's not going to change if we do that. But if we take acoustic to the Greek, something special may follow. And it, I think it goes down as one of, like, certainly for me, at least one of the most memorable shows we've ever, ever done. Sure. And uh, Matt, as their agent, um, when did you get this call? And did you think to yourself, <laughs> in the taxi what on the way? There? On the way, yeah. <laughs> I was very apprehensive. Um, not in in the sense of can they sell the tickets? It's, Greek's a big a big venue. Um, it was how their fans were going to react, and would it turn into a club show or would? It, and um, I was blown away by the the reaction. Everybody dressed up, came out, uh, were engaged on every I mean on every track. Um, it was magic. It really was. But I was definitely apprehensive. I mean, we had many talks about, is it the right move? <laughs> we ended up doing two Greeks. And, ended up, and yeah. the Skrillex came along to watch the first one and enjoyed it so much. You know, we, we managed to persuade him to come up on stage and play the guitar at the second one. And he was so cool about it. We, just, we rang him 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the Sunday and said, are you in? And he was like, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> and he jumped in the car and rehearsed for half an hour and then came up on stage. <laughs> Any plans to, to do further shows in that format? Yes, dreams at this point to do some more. Um, we would definitely like to do them, but we haven't really got a, a, a time scale for it yet. All right, so um, let's talk more about um, how I, I feel like you know artists today are expected to do so much more, and uh, the team that you've you've put together for this and. Matt, I want to include you in this conversation as well. I'm sorry we haven't <laughs> uh, got you in um, more, but you know, what's unique about this uh, situation from, from your point of view as you go out, try and find the right gigs? And you know, what's interesting about your role as an agent is you're, you're also kind of a manager. You've got to make the best decisions for the artist and where they're playing and how they're, how they're placed. So um, tell us about your um, connection to this project. Um, it came around about nine years ago. Um, and I guess one of the biggest challenges you touched on was, well, there's a picture of three of them. Why are there only two coming? <laughs> and that was when we were fighting over a very minimal amount of money. And it was, uh, that was a huge battle. But once we kind of got over that, um, 
it, it starts with a good team, and, and James and, and the, whole, the whole team is as solid as it comes. So once you have that foundation, it's about, you know, I look back, it's doing it the right way, is doing it the right way. Um, they never missed, we never skipped a step. So there was always a you know, three, four year plan kind of thing of, all right, we do this move to get to this move, to get to this move. And um, content was another thing. They always had content in the marketplace, whether it was albums. And from the first time I saw them, I came back to everyone's like, everyone sings along. This is a band. This isn't, this isn't like a DJ set. It's, it's a concert. And so with that, it, them writing songs, um, and then getting the right setups in the right markets, the right looks, the right festivals, uh, and then them delivering really has been the, been the path. You mentioned fans, and that's so you know much a part of it. <laughs> in, in your case especially, um, you have a very special connection to your fans. Um, how did that happen? You know, how does that happen for an artist, for a band, to make such a, uh, an authentic uh, connection and such an enthusiasm? And we saw that, well, we see that every time. <laughs> um, but it's, it's on the big screen in Under the Electric Sky. Um, you guys are featured prominently in the, the, the documentary on last year's uh, EDC and, and really a special moment with the character Sadie, um, who is the one you pick uh, to push, push the button. Um, but talk, talk about nurturing the relationship that, that you have with fans. I think it really started from the, the very beginning where you know, we felt, okay, yeah, we can make music, but how do we get people to actually be interested and listen? And, and that's been such a central thing. We quite uh, early on set up a, an internet forum uh, through which we could you know, connect through our fans around the world. This is way before Facebook or any social media. And, um, and it, it's been very central to, to our thing is, is how do we increase interaction with the people that, that listen to our music and, and how do we communicate what we do in a really good way that people get it the same that, that, that we do. And, and I think, Tony, your, your sort of history also from, from marketing and I and think that's just the thinking side of it. It's been really, really it's an, helpful. It's an interesting it? mix of people because that the, the we started with, Parvo essentially coded this first forum that we, we put up on the web, and he's you know, a genius uh, computer coder. That forum ended up being the most popular trance forum, bigger than trance.nu and trance addict, just the Anjuna Beats forum. And we used that forum to, to talk to people about the music and the upcoming releases and the gigs and everything else. And I think from, from those early beginnings, the, the, the idea that there was a, a two-way street between us and our fans was established. And then later, these other tools like Facebook and, and Twitter came along to help us do that. And, and there's more diagnostics and other stuff that you get from those platforms. But the idea that there were people out there that we could attract that we needed to communicate with, that's been there right from the start. But I also think that the nature of the music that we make is incredibly important in that connection. I think we've always been really interested in people's emotional response to music. I'm, I'm really fascinated by the, the power of music to inform people's internal dialogue. You give them advice in a musical form and they remember it. I mean, it can be you know things that happen to us in our lives become written into a song. And that, in some ways, is a kind of a therapeutic, cathartic experience for us to give it a, you know, a bright face, to have the last say in that little episode and to, to put a positive spin on it. And I think the, the beauty of what's happened is that there are other people out there who've had similar experiences in their lives, who see these songs, whether it be on a good day or far from in love or, or sun and moon, where they recognize some of the characters, or at least some of themselves, in the characters played out in those songs. And that, that's really where the connection comes from. And I think all of this, this, the marketing stuff is incredibly important and very enjoyable and very visible. But it's John the Baptist. The music is the Messiah. You know, because you, you have such a strong connection to fans, are there cases where the fans have kind of finished the story for you? Um, kind of taking an idea to, to a whole other, other place that you didn't expect? Well, I think maybe about four or five years ago, 
Um, we've been also making uh, A and B TV episodes, you know, little video documentaries of, of our uh, travels around the world. And, and at that point, we sort of decided that if we show the situation from the fans' point of view, um, you know, the, the, the illusion of, it, of that is so much bigger than if we are ourselves explaining what we do. We'll get our fans to, uh, you know, feature in, in the film and, um, and be the, the central characters. And, and I think the one we did in Beirut, I'm particularly um, mm. proud of. I think that was a moment for us where, you know, we obviously knew we have fans and stuff, but when we saw our own film of our Beirut gig, it really hit home that, you know, it's, it's very, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of, of the whole thing. Mm. I think also when we called the, um, the last album Group Therapy, we knew that it would, it would resonate, but that's an example of something the fans really sort of took to their hearts and ran with, and it ended up becoming like a sort of three-year campaign, almost, almost a movement in its own right, and we ended up renaming the radio show to reflect that. I think that's an example of what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the press play thing, tell, how did that start, and, and is that something you'll continue to, to do? <laughs> well, there was a cameraman on stage with us. We, we, we basically, in sun, we've been playing Sun and Moon a lot, and to freshen it up, we basically put a gap in the, in the breakdown so that we could start it again with the drop whenever we wanted to. And we maybe done that for a couple of gigs. And then there was one day there was this cameraman on stage, and I thought, well, I'll get him to push the button. So I got his finger and he's videoing himself with his finger and push the button. And then at the next gig, there were people with signs, you know, please let me push the button, because <laughs> he posted the, the video on YouTube. <laughs> so we started getting people up, and now it's just turned into this huge big deal, you know, where, where sometimes you come to a gig and there's, you know, there's 20 signs, and some of them got LEDs on. And my favorite one was this girl had this sign saying, please let my mum push the button with an arrow to her mum. <laughs> <laughs> so sweet. We've had five people up on stage. They're surprisingly uh, selfish when it comes to actually pushing the button. I'm hoping for this kind of big group fat finger to go down in unison and have this kind of, but no, people try and get there first. It's just ended up being a very important part of the show. I mean, I, we were talking um, in the green room about how we keep it fresh. Maybe, you know, it's, it's time we started thinking about something else. But yet it is this really important thing for the fans. They just, you know, the, the, to see one of the people in the audience get up and become part of the show, it's a wonderful thing. So I don't know what we'll do with it. Mm -hmm. I also like the fact that it also reminds us how awesome it is to be on stage and doing what yeah, we do. Because you know, after, say, 200, 300 shows, it's easy to forget what an awesome situation we have at these gigs. So, so bringing someone on stage and seeing it from their eyes is a really good way to, to really understand what it, how cool it is. Yeah, so. and you know, just gives you an argument against all the haters, just how much skill there is involved up there to push that button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, has anyone uh, screwed up pushing the button? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, if you keep the finger on it, you just get... <laughs> We've had that a few times. All right, so um, I know your minds are elsewhere as England uh, kicks off World Cup. And What's the we score? <laughs> we want to get you uh, out the door. Um, but I want to ask you um, going forward, um, you know, what's up with the group? What do you have in store? Are we going to see an album soon? What's going on? Well, we've been hard at work in our studios and, uh, and now are sitting on a wonderful iTunes playlist of more songs than we can fit on one album. Um, and now it's literally the, the last final push for us uh, to figure out which songs exactly end up on the album and which kind of versions we, we use of them. And um, you know, we already said probably about a year ago that the album would be out right now. And, uh, <laughs> and our <laughs> agent and manager here- A little over a year ago. Rescheduled things a few times. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But I suppose you know, we are quite anal about things. Uh, and, and it does take a lot longer than we ever expect. And normally the, the last 5% takes like 50% mm. of the time, so. Yeah, that's true. The short answer, Jason, is we need to get that album out by January. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mentioned you are in a new studio in London yeah. as well. That's exciting. Yeah, we, we actually managed to build a studio. Um, the, it's, the, the, there was a space that became available near our office in Bermondsey. 
So we basically built it from the ground up. It's got two studios in, one slightly larger than the other, and a room with a grand piano and some sofas and bookshelves and stuff in it. And it's really nice. And uh, every studio you ever walk in has this um, soundproof material on the wall. And if you look through, the, if you've got any sense of style, if you look through the book of colors that you can pick, your heart drops because they're all disgusting. They're like, you know, bright electric blue and burgundy and pink and everything else. Um, we used an, an external ex, uh, interior designer to, to, to plan it all, and she went for black, so we got black walls around the studio, and it looks amazing. But sound-wise also, we've been in very non-ideal situations for the past 15 years, and it's always been kind of easy to say, okay, well, it's, it's a little difficult to mix the, the the bass side of this mix, you know, it's, it's because we have a, a very bad listening situation in our studio. Okay, now we have an incredible sounding room, and it's still as difficult as it ever was. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, will there be any um, reflections of your acoustic um, work in this this new album? Yeah, we're, we're we're actually going to be doing acoustic versions of all the singles as they come out, um, and we are currently arguing about the acoustic version of Blue Sky Action. Are we arguing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's just so many ways you could do it. The argument is right now, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, any other highlights this summer? Of course, uh, EDC is on your mind right now, but anything you're looking forward to? Yeah, there's this small venue in New York called Madison Square Garden that we're playing in, um, in October. Is it October? October? October the 18th, yeah, for our 100th radio show, 100th group therapy. And uh, so the radio show ongoing continues. Uh, any other dabbling in other areas? Tony, I have this sense that you really always are trying to, to push the, the concepts in, in new yeah, spaces. Yeah, I've got an interview with uh, KCRW to be the new host of Morning Becomes Eclectic in a couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to that. We'll see about Only that. Only <laughs> All right. Well, I hope we have time for questions. Do we? John, are we... We can just do a couple. Let's yeah, a couple. couple. All right. Let's hey, by it. the way, I just want to point out that Madison Square Garden show sold out in mere minutes. Um, it's really incredible, I think. Um, and, and I have to take one minute just to gush a little bit. Um, I come from the rock business. I fell into the dance music world three years ago. You guys are the ones that really inspired me. Um, you're by far and away my favorite dance music group, by far. Thank you. Um, and I think you're basically right up there with Led Zeppelin and the Beatles. So you're incredibly inspirational oh. to me. It's huge. Uh, question, do you have a question? <laughs> So, uh, hi, I'm Stefan Virtuals, guys. Um, mine's more like a comment to you. A little a, louder? More like a comment than rather than a question. And talking about being analytical, I have to read it, but I want you guys to know that this really comes from the sincerity of my heart. Um, in the summer of 2011, you guys released an album that changed my life. In some ways, between the beats, lyrics, and the energy from them, I felt like group like the group therapy album was written and released just for me. Then I came to EDC in 2011, and from Kinetic Field, you guys took me to places in my mind where I had experienced true joy in my life. As I stood there, I have never felt more connected to everyone around me. I wanted to publicly stand today and extend my respect, gratitude, and love back to you that you have so freely given to me. Please continue doing what you do. I will be here listening, supporting, and now producing what you have ignited in me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure how you're going to follow that one up, but good luck. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a tough act to follow. Uh, big supporter mm -hmm. of you guys. Um, seen you a, a handful of times and have always been my favorite. Um, but my question for you is I, I actually saw you at the Bill Graham Auditorium, um, I believe either this year or last year in San Francisco. And what blew me away is I was like, as I was stumbling through and partying with everyone, and it was like the amazing experience. And my name is Max. I don't even think I introduced myself. So pleasure to uh, make my acquaintance. Um, I, I looked up. <laughs> I looked up, and there's a big like a Decepticon of Walter White like coming out of the sky. And um, you, you know, you guys, it, like it just scared me and then blew me away. And I'm like, like, what the hell is going on here? And so I guess my question to you is, um, you know, you you created this this amazing track and and there's this it, it like blew it out into this whole new realm of lore. So where was the inspiration for that? Um, and yeah, I don't know if you can go on uh, a little bit about how that 
went down. So I, th I thought that was really fascinating. And thanks again. Well, I think Walter, well, thank you. Walter White was one of the tracks that when it was being written, there was a feeling that it's a track that totally transforms. And, and our thinking was that, you know, when it starts, you have no idea where it's going to go. And, and I suppose that's where the connection with Breaking Bad came. Because we were, all, we're all still massive fans of Breaking Bad. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it's, it's that evolution of the, the lead character that, that really was the inspiration for that track and hence the name. So um, we have one of your, so, so I think uh, you may have touched on this, but Above and Beyond kind of closes our movie, um, the Under the Electric Sky movie. Um, and we have one of the co-stars, one of your co-stars from the movie here, Jose, and Jose has a question. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, do you guys plan on like... A little louder, a, Jose. Do you guys yeah. plan on bringing another Ocean Lab album out? We're... Not sure. What okay. we are sure of is that we should work with Justine Suisa. Um, whether we call it Ocean Lab or Above and Beyond is still up for debate, really. Um, she has written some songs for the new album, and there's one that's definitely going to be probably the last track on the album. So we're definitely still, still going to be working with her, but because Ocean Lab may be slightly confusing what we call it, we're not so sure whether we'll call it Ocean Lab anymore. All right. Thank you. Let's just do one more question and then we'll uh, let you get to the uh, football game. I know we're all hoping... In all seriousness, does anyone have the score? <laughs> zero, zero. zero. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Jose Morales. I'm a student from uh, Southern California. And first of all, I just want to thank you for uh, bringing the acoustic show to Los Angeles. It's a beautiful show. It really represented uh, what trance music is. Just thank beautiful, you. beautiful. Um, so my question is, uh, are there any artists you wish you signed or that you would like to work with? Uh, a few of the artists that come to mind is like Andrew Royale or uh, Spark7. Your turn. Uh, sorry, I, did, I didn't quite catch you. Were you asking, are there some artists that we're really looking to sign and, and work with? Or are you talking collaboration? That we wish artists that you, would, yeah. you wish you signed? Yeah. or that you would really like to work with? I wish we'd signed Seven Lions. I think he's amazing. Um, yeah. I think he makes incredible music. I think his mix of uh, On My Way to Heaven is the best version of that song. I think he's my favorite DJ live. That's enough gushing on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think when we've been um, looking for artists for our label, one of the things that we have always thought is also important is is how do we get on and what kind of people they are. Uh, because we're always looking for a very long relationship with the producer for, for the label. And I think Seven Lions is yeah. a lovely, I, lovely I, guy. I really <laughs> appreciate that you mix, mix it up. You know, like I'm, I'm into these Lancelot records that have been coming out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that old track, uh, w which was in, you know, in my set for a long time, uh, Beautiful Life by Martin Roth. Yeah. Love that record. Um, but you, you know, you always switch things up, and sometimes it's even more experimental. Lately, I've heard some things that are really left field. So, cheers for that. We should you. say hats off to James for, for, for driving the Angina Deep label the last few years. I think it's, it's managed to get its own identity, and it's a very sought after destination for artists these days. So and yeah, you guys actually did uh, Dusky too, right? Yep. Yeah, Dusky was huge. Nicely done. They are. Okay. <laughs> well, well, was huge or still is huge? <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, let's thank our guests above and beyond this morning. Thank you. At EDM Biz. You guys have a great EDC this weekend. Much love. Thank you, guys. Thank you.